Welcome to Conversations with Cox and Kielseth, and to be more specific, that is filmmaker Alex Cox and myself, film curator Pablo Kielseth. Alex will join us by phone from his home in Oregon while I sneak away from my office to call him from one of the projection booths used by the International Film Series, which has been screening foreign and independent movies at CU Boulder since 1941. We will keep our chats to about 20 minutes as we discuss whatever movie-related topics grab our fancy. Thanks for joining us. Okay, action. Alex, how are you? How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. And yourself? I'm doing just fine, thanks. I'm excited to talk about this documentary, but what are you, what are you relaxing with right now? I'm drinking... Uh, 10 Barrels Brewing Pearl. And I've decided I'm going to write to the company and tell them that they've got to take, they've got some picture of some some district in Bend, you know, like a kind of with a mountain behind it. It looks totally boring. And they could replace that picture with a picture of my dog, Pearl, and I think sales <laughs> would go through the roof. You know? Well, that, that would be a great idea. I'm a big fan. So, uh, Pearl, Pearl was a good companion to you, and, and, and I had uh, fun adventures with her in the car as well. So I, I'm going to be insistent on this. I may be asking you to send an email of support. You know, I, I am to happy it. to, uh, if, if you need any kind of documentation, and that includes photos, I am happy to back you up on that. Yeah. They'll be overwhelmed by the emails and letters. So anyway, what are you drinking? Uh, I am uh, doing a mash between the uh, 20, 21st Amendment Blood Orange IPA and the Deschutes Wowza Low Calorie IPA. Um, it's uh, oh, wow. kind of a go-to for me right now, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's refreshing, yeah, and it's not too, not too strong, so that's nice. And the Deschutes also comes from Bend, Oregon, I believe, doesn't it? Bend has a great beer scene. No, there's no yeah. disputing. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Now we get serious because now we're going to talk about this this documentary. And when was it made? This documentary. Uh, it was uh, 1982. Came out and and actually, well, just let me rewind here for people who are listening, because um, today we are going to talk about a uh, a powerful documentary that was made 40 years ago, and it was recently restored. It will be screening via our website at www.internationalfilmseries.com starting this Friday, and the doc is called Dark Circle. And it has much to do with Rocky Flats, which made plutonium triggers for nuclear bombs um, between 1952 and 1992. And it happens to be located about eight miles south of the Boulder County line. And I, of course, am recording from Boulder. It was directed by Chris Beaver and Judy Irving. IFS customers should recognize Judy Irving's name because she also directed... The Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill and Pelican Dreams, both being titles that were, you know, very successful at the IFS. Uh, she also did some cinematography on Roger and Me and gets special thanks in the Atomic Cafe, which I only mention because Dark Circle feels like it definitely falls somewhere between those two in terms of its approach and tone. It won the grand prize at Sundance in 1983. And I actually remember seeing it that year because that was the same year I attended a protest at Rocky Flats. And I've even got the pictures to prove it. I've seen some of these pictures. Didn't you and Rolf get arrested? Um, yeah. Actually, no, no, we, we, got, we got arrested for a, a protesting CIA recruitment on campus. So that was a separate protest situation. Oh, yeah. Um, Rolf, is your, Rolf is Pablo's dad for the uninitiated, Rolf. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll actually, uh, I'll, I'll, Alex, I'll send you some pictures because they're fun. But, man, you know, it's, it's been 40 years since I've seen it, and, and, or almost, and I've forgotten, I've forgotten a lot of the things that were in there, which uh, it's got some really harsh footage that I'm surprised I must have blocked it out especially the pigs getting baked in the in their suits but anyway it brings home a lot of really oh. uh, Im important points that haunt you know sadly they still haunt the human race in a big kind of way um, I guess I'll, at the time of the making of Dark Circle there were some 50,000 nuclear arms worldwide and by 1986 there were over 70,000 I think I don't I'm not 100% sure right now I think the number stands somewhere between 14 and 20,000 so you know, some progress was made, but then obviously we got a long way to go and there's all kinds of new calamities facing mankind that might strain 
our our psyche in different ways. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we have a bipartisan project in the United States to spend as much as one point seven trillion dollars renewing the entire nuclear inventory with new warheads and new Great. delivery devices. So yeah. the documentary is super timely. You know, yeah. it's it's not like it's it's gone away or it doesn't it doesn't you know, it's a story that doesn't need to be told. When you said forty years ago, I thought, wow. I was aware obviously that it was an older documentary because of the aspect ratio. You know, it's four by three. It's like this, an old television frame, an old video frame. Yeah, but it's uh, shot on 16 millimeter, clearly. <laughs> oh, it was shot on 16. It wasn't even shot on video. Of course, it was shot on 16. Wow. Yeah. But it's, um, it's a very powerful piece. And some of the stuff, like you say, I mean, the incineration of the poor pigs, the guy from Hiroshima, when he takes off his, his shirt and you see the extent of the burns on this guy's body, like... yeah. Decades after, the and, and they also Hiroshima. they also they, they they touch on that one point that you and I brought up, which was that no country has bombed itself more with nuclear bombs than the United States, and 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 that came with a a, a very real price tag in terms of uh, human lives, and because are all these people that were sort of put in harm's way, who then later died of leukemia, who spent their life fighting to get some kind of help and never received it. I mean, it's a depressing story, really. And and, and a bit like COVID, you know, the reason it doesn't, you know, it, people don't care, really, or the state doesn't care is because it's mostly poor people. You know, it's like poor farmers or people or people in cities who just don't even know they got irradiated, you know, and... and What's it to the ruling class? Except that then this, this really bizarre thing happened, um, which isn't dealt with. It's nothing to do with the theme of the documentary, but someone should make a movie out of the story of the conqueror, don't you think? Uh, the conqueror? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. What, what, could you uh, tell me, elaborate? That was a movie that was shot out near St. George, Utah, which we flew into when we were making Build the Galactic Hero. Uh -huh. And not far from St. George, Utah, there were some very nice, like, sand dunes and rocky rocky formations and stuff. So uh, they went and made this Hollywood movie there about Genghis Khan. John Wayne plays Genghis Khan. Pedro Armendariz Jr., the Mexican actor, plays his, his faithful sidekick, Lefty. And uh, the director was Dick Powell. They shot this movie in what it turned out was a former nuclear testing site and went back to Hollywood and shooting exteriors at Culver City or shooting, you know, interiors on the stage. They figured out, oh, we want to have the sand look like it did out there in Utah. So they trucked all this sand from the testing site into the Culver City studios and shot with it. And, you know, it's also it's absurdly stupid, except that then... Wayne, Pedro Armendariz, Dick Powell, all got inoperable cancer and died as a result of it. And in theory, there was like an out of, you know, the, the studio made a settlement with Powell's family and Pedro Armendariz shot himself. And of course, Wayne was like a, a poster child for, you know, struggling with cancer for many years. Well, he was a, he was a long time smoker, too. That didn't and he help. was a long time smoker, too. That's absolutely yeah. true, and so is Pedro Armendariz. Um, yeah. But I, I, you know, I don't think shooting in the and and you see those are the names that I know. There were other people in the production who also died, but they aren't as famous. Yeah. Well, I've never seen The Conqueror, and that's an interesting story. Uh, then where did you find out about the sand being trucked in? That seems like something that you don't necessarily see on IMDb anywhere. <laughs> it's a bizarre story, but I think that probably it is if you were to go to the IMDb page or do an internet search for it, it's been reported, the whole bizarre tale of the Conqueror and, 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 and really the desire to say, hey, look, this is a great location. We can shoot here even though they did set off a bomb 10 years ago, you know, and... Anyway, it's interesting to, to, to research, and it definitely ties into what we're talking about. The other thing that I think is relevant to the Rocky Flats documentary... Oh, um, you know what? 
I just looked it up, uh, Alex, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but you are, you, you know, it is on IMDb. It says there that he was one of 91 people, along with John Wayne, Susan Howard, and Agnes Moorhead, whose cancer was attributed to their exposure to radioactivity while working on the film The Conqueror. So, yeah, this is... Susan uh, Howard and Agnes Moorhead as well. And, wow, 91 people. 91 people. Oh. Wow. Jesus. And so, sure, you could say that Wayne was a big smoker or Pedro was a big smoker or whatever. I mean, there are other factors as well, but that's a... Wow, I had no idea of so many people. So, uh, and I'm sorry, you were saying something and I interrupted. Oh, yeah. Well, one time that we were down in Salida... Um, I went to a bookstore with Todd because she was doing a reading there. And in the bookstore, they had like a bin of free books because they were, they were uh, copies that they sent out for review, you know. So they couldn't yeah. sell them. They were giving them away. And I got a book uh, out of the bin called Full Body Burden by Kristen Iverson. And mm. she grew up like downwind of Rocky Flats. With a, with a very kind of patriarchal father who thought it was all great and, you know, rah, 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 and was also an alcoholic and totally self-destructive. And, and this book, Full Body Burden, is the parallel story of the Rocky Flats nuclear plant and her relationship growing up with, with this insane father. And it's a really good book and they're making a documentary based on that as well based on Kristen Iverson's story right, what was that what was the title of that book again full body burden the idea being that hey you know over a lifetime well you could take a full body burden of x number of ronchins you know and and then but then it becomes debatable what the full body burden really is it's the the documentary is still in progress i guess they obviously slowed up because of the the, the crisis but they're talking about uh being in post-production throughout 2021 and having it finished next year oh wow so that's so. that you know uh that's something i should mention to um our friends over at the uh, uh norland archives here at the cu library because uh, i don't know if you had a chance to look at it but they uh they've actually got a whole bunch of stuff uh, in the archives that is that relates specifically to Rocky Flats. And, I looked um, at that. They have the Rocky Flats archive. Yeah, I looked at it. Yeah, it's kind of fascinating stuff, isn't it? It is, but boy, I mean, there's so much stuff that you could spend weeks plowing through all that stuff. Yeah. You just start, I mean, because you don't know which document to open. I mean, I opened one and started scrolling through, and I got to... System troubleshooting is currently underway. The entire building has been placed on full face respiratory protection as a precautionary <laughs> measure until the problem can be resolved. Yeah. But they didn't quite know what the problem was, so just everybody has to wear respirators when they go into the building. And it was a totally chaotic yeah. operation. They lost, like, an unbelievable amount of plutonium unaccounted for. Several several times. I mean, I, I opened on a random page, and it read... Um, an employee was found radiologically contaminated at the uh, step pad during required monitoring. The contamination existed on the coveralls and low-level contamination on the left ring finger. And that's just a random, just a random, imagine working there. Um, of, but what's interesting is that we're now living in a time when contamination, and we're about to open up the universities, uh, and there's like frats that are pledging, and 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 so we're we're gonna have a first day of classes on Monday, and we're all just uh, those of us on the sidelines are just wondering what are the new numbers going to be because when you're talking about contamination and this uh, plague about us, we're dealing with um, some some very unpredictable behavioral statistics that don't look good at the moment. I would be very worried. I mean, if I was, I mean, I assume that, that you know, obviously the faculty are going to do their best to take care of themselves and their students. But think about all the staff and the position that they're in when, you know, I mean, if supposedly, you know, a faculty can say, you know, I can't teach this class in that room because it's not safe. But can like an, an adjunct say that? Or does the adjunct just have to put up with it? Yeah, the adjuncts have never had a lot of power here in the university. So you are right to raise that point. Because you got, I mean, if the thing is, if they're going to reopen the university, I mean, they better be making absolutely 100% best efforts to make it safe and, and to keep everybody, well, and all the usual stuff that we talk about. But, well, there is, but it's there a is, big risk. Uh, 
I, I, I am impressed with um, the level of uh, and the proof will be in the putting, but according to what I've read, they've got some new uh, saliva tests that supposedly get results within 45 minutes. Um, Great. I'm, I imagine that that's going to um, help really give give data important data in a timely fashion because that's, that's that'll be great that, because they yeah. because the other test is also very intrusive where they stick the thing down your nose. I, 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 I think they're still going to do that too, so it's going to be sort of a double prong. Well, well, you know, because <laughs> the, the, the fast one might not be as reliable as the um, the, huh. the swab, so. It will be very interesting to observe what happens then next week. However, um, yeah. I'll bring this back to Dark Circle just because I do want to remind folks that this is uh, – uh, it, it, the restoration is great, by the way. I mean, you really get yeah, to see – Yeah, it really looks good. And for those of you for, – for those who are listening who are here in Boulder, I mean, the focus on Rocky Flats takes up a good chunk of the dock. It's, it's not just Rocky Flats, though. It does move around. And, and it covers, no, they go to Hiroshima. Um, yeah. They talk. They go to Diablo Canyon. They talk about all of this insane, insane right. nuclear project. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a real uh, important watch. Uh, I can't recommend it enough. And uh, there will be some added components, uh, especially with uh, our friends over at the archives. Um, we're going to uh, hopefully cull some items that might be of special interest to give uh, extra context to this. So um, definitely uh, put it on your radar that this will be available to watch from our website at international, internationalfilmseries.com starting Friday onward. Um, I think we'll be hanging on to it for a couple of weeks at least. Um, Great. Yeah. Yeah, it's and, really worth watching. It's a yeah. good, it's, a, it's really, I'm glad you turned me on to it because it's a very, it's a very good piece. And uh, it's, it's a launch. I mean, I, I feel like it, it, it's, it really begs for a... Um, a doc that kind of brings things up to speed uh, as to where things are now. And I don't know, is there something, you keep abreast of this pretty well, is there something that's been done currently that is like, uh, that you you would pair up with Dark Circle, Alex? You know, I think the nuclear issue has been kind of ignored. I mean, that's what's so nice about Dark Circle is it addresses it, you know, and it's a 40-year-old documentary. I mean, yeah. it's the issue hasn't gone away. You're right, the, the absolute number of nuclear weapons in the world may have gone down, but but they aren't as important as, as as the nuclear weapons that are on hair trigger alert. And there's thousands and thousands of them. I, I will say, though, that um, uh, re remember that book we both read when it came out? Uh, it was Command and Control. Uh, and, and they did make a, um, a documentary from that book. So that, that might yeah, be... Yeah, uh, the, Doomsday, the Doomsday Machine by Daniel Ellsberg is also a very good book. Yeah. And there's some of the some old Pauls who've repented have written a book now called The Button, which goes on about some of the same issues. The Ellsberg one, I, yeah, I thought Command and Control was very good. It was a good book, but I, I, I think the Ellsberg book is very interesting because he was involved in nuclear targeting. And one hmm. thing that he says in the book over and over again is that there is no presidential authority because the assumption is the president will be killed in a surprise attack. And so, therefore, everybody who's got a nuclear weapon has the power to launch it, which is terrifying. Right. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, oh, and those... also this week, I'm, yeah. I'm go also I'm going to make a special announcement this week because of the Xander Schloss video. Xander has done this video of the old Clash song, Straight to Hell, to coincide with Joe Strummer's birthday. And it's going live on the weekend. Oh, when is the birthday? Is that... Uh... Well, this is interesting. The birthday is on Friday, I think, or the birthday anniversary is on Friday and the, and the show... Xander's show goes live on Sunday, but he, I think I, this is interesting the politics of it because he's a bit he's a bit pissed off because he was like Strummer's right hand man, his guitar player. They 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 did the Walker soundtrack together. Xander toured for two years with Strummer in the Latino Rockabilly War and played guitar on on Earthquake Weather and and he's kind of pissed because he didn't get invited to participate in the in the Strummer birthday thing. I guess it's an anniversary. of and, well, and so strange. he's done this thing. Hmm? That is strange. Yeah, it's well, I know it's not strange because it's all about the glory of Mike Bono and Jim Jarmusch and stuff like that. It's not about people who actually played music with Strummer. So, um, so I think the best thing is that he's, do he's just done this thing on his, own, on his own accord with no money just because he wants to get something out there to celebrate his pals. You know, well, I am so glad that you reminded me of that work. because, um, Alex, we 
we finally, finally, finally got around to posting uh, your double feature of Highway Patrolman and Straight to Hell Returns. So yes, uh, yes. So that's that's a double feature that you can watch from our website of Alex's. Uh, uh, of course, I've always talked highly about Highway Patrolman from that was uh, in 1991. Uh, Straight to Hell Returns. That they're saying 1986, but is that right? Is that uh, let me think? It's... When was it made? I think that's right. Yeah, 19, it was made in 1986. Straight to Hell was made in 1986, and then Straight to he- Hell Returns is a kind of a re a, a, a revamp of it made um, about ten years ago. And the one that's playing on your site is a new version made by Kino Lorber. They've taken Straight to Hell Returns and they've put it back in the scope ratio that it was in oh. when it first came out. So it's a 1 to 2.35 aspect ratio, uh, as it was in the theatres. Um, right. But with the additional material, and they're calling that the director's cut. Um, so that's what you're going to be showing. Yes. Okay. And in terms of that uh, special link that you're going to share with us, uh, we'll we'll find a way of putting it out there. But it's it's a great a great cover of um, of the clash. The song. Well, the song has hell. nothing to do with the film. The film is called Straight to Hell because we were just referencing the song title. But but right. the two things are completely separate. And this is Xander's. You know, Xander's Xander was Strummer's henchman for many years. His guitar guy, and uh, and this is his solo version of Straight to Hell made um, during lockdown. But we should we should add, of course, that for for the uninitiated that. Uh, fans of the Clash and of Joe Strummer should note that uh, he, Joe Strummer is in uh, Straight to Hell. So I mean, you know, he's and it's a it's a great performance. Actually. He's one of the stars. He's uh, he's the yeah. he's yeah he's he comes over very well in it. So uh, oh, um, and if you are listening and you have not yet seen Highway Patrolman or Straight to Hell Returns, and you are interested, um, uh, send me an email. Uh, you can do that through. Um, I think there's a, a link there on our, on our web page. And I've got a couple codes to give out, so that if you're uh, if you're pressed for cash, I'm I'm happy to give out uh, some of these codes on a first come first serve basis. So, uh, Alex, thank you for reminding me about that. And um, with that, oh, and uh, thank you also yeah. for thank you also for screening the Rocky Flats documentary, which which is a must see. Yeah, I I agree. It's a must see, not just for those of us who live eight miles away from it, but for anyone. <laughs> Uh, and, yeah, and do check true. it out. And again, um, links will be provided at our website. So thanks again for listening, everybody. And Alex, thanks for talking with me. And we'll uh, chat again next week. We will. All right. Ciao. Ciao. Cut. Okay, that's a wrap. Thanks again for joining Alex Cox and myself today. I'd like to thank Jason Phelps for handling the audio and Ted Thacker for letting us use the intro to his song, The Ballad of Slim Cessna, for the musical cues that bookend these conversations.